Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, and also, thank you for the opportunity to give a presentation on the diagnostic of CSF leaks. Um, I um, do not have any conflicts of interest. And we all know the possibility for a CSF leak between the brain and the outer space, that means the nasal cavity on the one hand and the middle ear cavity on the other hand, um, is very complex anatomi anatomically set and um, uh, the, that makes it sometimes really ch challenging not only to close a leak but also um, in some cases when it's a micro leak or a very, very tiny leak not producing a lot of CSF, then it's sometimes really challenging to diagnose it. So what, what's the approach? Or what, what, are we, what are we doing in um, handling these patients? And in the literature, there's quite, a, quite a, a numerous amount of names for the same or more or less the same uh, problem, uh, like CSF leaks, like primary CSF leak, or like secondary CSF leak, or occult CSF leaks. But what, what are we actually talking about? It's very nice to, to, be, to be clear about it. And so I will present you two groups. The first group is um, the situation um, when you are on call um, on a Friday night or Sunday morning at two o'clock and you, 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 you take, um, you are presented a, p a patient with, a, with an ac acute head trauma. Um, this is so, so the, the acute traumatic um, situation. Um, so this is the one group, traumatic CSF leaks. And the second group is sort of all, all, all the rest, all, all, all the others. <clears throat> I mean, th that was um, a professional football player. Um, and he came to our outpatient department many weeks after. He said, I had sort of concussion to my head. There was, CT was taken, but there was no sign of any fracture or anything, but since then he had a watery discharge. So what to do? So this is a typical situation for the second group, a patient coming a long time after you to, the, to your clinic, and they say, I have some watery discharge from time to time, and maybe there was a trauma or not, and it's not always clear. So this is an example for the second group. Um, may I uh, take you along, uh, this might be a little bit boring now, the next five minutes, um, just uh, to show you our approach um, in, a, in respect to which biomarker are we using or which might be recommended and what is, the, what is actually the, the um, role of imaging, like CT or MRI, and also, last but not least, what is uh, uh, what, when or, or, or when should you use sodium fluorescein? I will let you know which slides are useful to take picture. So um, I, um, I, will let, I will let you know. So for the first group, the acute traumatic patients with a head trauma, road traffic accident or whatever. Um, what to do first? Of course you do a CT scan first. You start with imaging, isn't it? And usually a high resolution CT, and if you find a dislocated fracture, you base your indication for surgery, of course, um, on that mainly uh, for surgery um, to reduce the fracture and at the same time, if there's a leak, to close the leak. I mean, that's, that's, that's obvious. At the same time, when you are on call Friday night uh, with, with that patient or Sunday morning at 2 o'clock, um, it's very nice, and you see there's a discharge, take a sample. Take a sample and take it to the lab um, for a biomarker which tells you this is a patient with a CSF leak. Because that might be transient, as we all know. So when this, uh, when this biomarker tells you there is no CSF, of course you do not have to operate unless it's a dislocated fracture, of course. If this 
biomarker tells you, yes, that is a CSF leak, then this will help you to find an indication and to operate on this patient, even if the dislocation maybe is not that high or that much. But what about these patients with a fracture, skull base fracture, without any dislocation or just a slight dislocation, which would not require surgery? What to do with them? In this case, it's very nice to have this first sample taken in the acute phase because then you can observe the patient very easily for one or two weeks, or maybe you say the patient should come back to your office three or four weeks later, and you can follow up this patient and take one more secretion sample from that area where you have the area or the site of, of a possible leak. And you take a second sample, and we do this, um, usually we uh, ask the patient to come twice on two days, like for example, a Thursday and a Friday, you put a mirror seal sponge in the nose on one side. On a th Thursday, you leave it overnight, and next day on Friday, you take it out and you have the secretion sample, the second one, to make sure that there is no CSF leak. So that was the first group. And if you want to take a photo, please. <laughs> the second group is much more common. I mean, these patients usually are handled by Maxfax surgeons or, or uh, neuro neurosurgeons. But the second group is much more common for the ENT. And this is a patient with a suspected CSF leak. And what do you do there first? You start with a secretion sample. Don't start with a CT scan or an MRI scan. Of course, you might be happy and get, f find the leak. But often that is just waste of time and waste of energy and maybe waste of some trust the patient brings to yourself. So start with a secretion sample, please. And if that biomarker tells you there is no CSF leak and you may use either beta trace protein, which is prostaglandin D synthesis, or you may use beta 2 transferrin, they're almost similar. And if the biomarker tells you there's no, no leak, so it's not necessary to, to, to operate, if the biomarker tells you it's indicated for say, CSF, then you start with imaging, of course. There's some little gray area between 0.7 and 1.3 milligram per liter when you're using beta trace protein where it's not really clear. Yes, that might be indicative or that might not be indicative for CSF leak. And in these cases, you will need also a sample, a blood, a blood sample, and you also test the blood sample for the same biomarker for beta trace protein. And then you, you get the ratio. And when the ratio between the secretion, better trace in the secretion, and better trace in the serum is above two, yes, then it's an indicative for CSF. If that ratio is below two, um, it's not indicative. And when you have a sample um, which is indicative for CSF, you start the, uh, the imaging, and that's fairly straightforward. Of course, you start with uh, high-resolution res CT scan. If you find the leak, that's fine, then you can operate usually endoscopically. If you do not find the leak, you go on with an CISS sequence MRI scan, which is without any contrast, but it's flow sensitive. So it's not very much invasive. If you find the leak in that case, after you have taken a CT and after you have taken the flow sensitive MRI scan, you find the leak, that's fine. If not, you have to go on and um, take either a CT, CT, CT scan or MRI scan um, uh, with intrathecal contrast. You can discuss it with your colleagues uh, in the radiologic department. And uh, again, if you find the leak, you can operate. If you do not find the leak after this imaging process, then uh, we think it's, that's the situation where you should use sodium fluorescein. So this is the whole... Um, uh, approach, we are, and, and uh, the last 15, 20 years, we had quite good, good experience with this. In the literature, you will find some slight different, different um, cutoff values for better, tr better trace protein, but this is the most recent one, actually. So what you might, may remember when you go home from today, <laughs> today's session, 1.3 milligram, above 1.3 milligram better trace is indicative 
for CSF. By the way, um, in human CSF, the amount of beta trace protein, how much is that? Um, it's one of the most abundant proteins in the human CSF after albumin. It's between 25 28 milligram per liter. Um, and when you have a very bloody sample, like after, immediately after surgery, then it seems that beta trace protein is a little bit better biomarker compared to beta 2 transferrin. Now, sodium fluorescein, um, many of you have used it and know it. It looks like this. It's a very intense color. Probably, uh, the problem is it's an off-label, an off-label, um, uh, off-label um, substance when you use it on, in the human body. Um, when you put blue light on it, it looks like this. It's fluorescence, and then it's very nice when you have uh, um, applied this intrathecally. Uh, you, you, you may, may uh, the, the CSF leak might become very obviously, or again with blue light, it's, it's really, really loosened. And it, it also helps during surgery to make sure that, the, that you have closed the leak. That's the situation intraoperatively when you, when you are trying to find the, the defect. And when, again, with blue light, you see the, the fluorescence um, at, the, at the area. So this is the, the recipe for the uh, sodium fluorescein. As I said, it's off-label, and please get the information and the informed consent from that patient yourself before you use it. You might also make a skin prick test in advance to, to rule out any allergic reaction, but I've never seen any re re allergic reaction to sodium fluorescein. And then it's uh, applied via lumbar puncture. <clears throat> You aspirate about 10 mils of CSF, you abort it, and then you use water for injection. There's a very nice study from Brazil um, from two, 2007, very nice study, and they found out when you, when you mix sodium fluorescein in water for injection, the distribution in the CSF space is much faster. So you can do it the same morning. That's very, very nice. Earlier, when you mix it in in Outlook CSF, what we have done many times, then we had to do it either the evening before or, or many hours before surgery, and then position the patient in, in different positions and so on. Be very careful with the dosage, please, because there are different preparations on the market um, with sodium fluorescein. Make sure that you have the, either the 10% solution when you use this, uh, this dosage, um, otherwise, you have to calculate, sit down and calculate how much you give, because it's ne neurotoxic and inject it really slowly. Take, take, it takes about few, two or three minutes to inject it, and, and then you're fairly safe. Okay, what about occult CSF leaks? Um, I will not go into that a lot. We will hear about it more, but we have three studies so far um, um, that these are the leaks which, which are not um, observed otherwise. So the principle is um, when you have a patient after peronasal sinus surgery um, and you remove the, uh, the nasal packing one or second day after surgery, um, you, not, you do not throw it away. You collect a secretion sample and send it to the lab for the biomarker to find out if there's any CSF or not. And we have three studies so far. One study found 2.9%. One study there was 0%. And the most recent study um, found 13% uh, um, uh, out of 30 patients. The study actually was planned with 50 patients, but the ethical committee said you have to stop this study. I don't know why. You may ask it, uh, but don't ask me. Um, so, uh, where do we expect the, uh, the, the CSF leaks? We will hear about it more. I um, should not go into this too much right now. This is all just a short video, um, uh, the endoscopic view, um, which is about 10 years ago. An elderly lady, 78 years old, with a spontaneous uh, leak from the nose, uh, running every day. And now we are entering the sphenoid sinus on the left, patient's left-hand side, and you see this large um, um, extension of the sphenoid sinus. And um, when, if you watch down here, the, 
the um, side or the floor of the sphenoid sinus, you may imagine, I mean, this is, these are the endoscopes we had to handle, uh, we, the, the pictures we got about 10, 15 years ago, but there was clear, clear um, evidence uh, for a, a leak and, and clear watery uh, fluid in the sphenoid sinus. <coughs> okay, thank you. So uh, you find in the literature the, the numbers um, in the spontaneous, the non -trauma, in the non-traumatic situation, um, about one third is from the Sternberg's canal or from the cribriform plate. And um, in um, non-traumatic cases, um, uh, fr from another publication in 2011, uh, again, about one third um, from the cribriform plate um, and up to 60% from Sternberg's canal or from the sphenoid sinus. How is the situation in traumatic cases? Um, there, of course, you have some, some leaks from the frontal or from the anterior skull base and, and uh, only 14% from the sphenoid sinus as, as, as expected as fractures are not very common in this area. So, coming to the conclusions, the traumatic CSF leaks, of course, you start with imaging first, but please do not forget, in the acute phase, take a sample and send it to the lab for a biomarker to check if that, if that is actually a CSF leak or not. And in all the others, in uh, or non-traumatic CSF leaks, start always with a secretion sample first, and then uh, only if that is... If you know um, biochemically or uh, have this confirmation, it's a leak, then go on with imaging. Thank you very much.